Right. Good afternoon, everybody. Lovely to see you all back again. My name is Dion Null. I'm the uh, CEO of the Global Resilience Partnership, and uh, really great to follow the, the amazing panel we had earlier on. I, I really like the combination of sort of the rational thinking that it only takes 10% of what we're currently investing in the energy sector to, to transform it, the reality of what's being faced in the Gambia, as well as the honest and human and emotive component that we saw from uh, the uh, Extinction Rebellion and, and youth representatives. So really, very good start. Um, but the, the previous panel was meant to lay out the challenge uh, and the urgency with which we need to act. And now this group, the, the challenge of this group is, is to, to describe how we respond to that challenge. And we're uh, very uh, happy to have such a diverse uh, panel with us. And I think um, the, the central principle of, of resilience is that um, decentralized and inclusive uh, decision making, especially in uncertain and uh, unpredictable situations. Decisions are best made closest to the ground. These are the people who understand the situations best and are able to respond best to these challenges. So the subject of this uh, panel discussion is getting money to where it matters the most. So getting those who are at the front line of these impacts uh, in a position in which they can respond to the challenges that we're facing. And I really like the, the title of this, this uh, session, Leading from the Front, because I think we need to get on the front foot, we need to lead from the front, but we also need those who are at the front line of these impacts that we're facing to have a, a better leadership role in the decisions we make. Uh, so this is really what we're wanting to discuss. Uh, we, we heard in the last session that those who contribute least to climate change are bearing the most of the impacts, and yet uh, only about 18% of international public climate finance is, is and even less of, of private uh, finance is, lead, is reaching the least developed countries. So money is just not reaching the places where it is needed the most. But I think I'd, I reiterate uh, that we should not slip into a mentality of victimhood here. Uh, that uh, this is not a narrative of the global north helping the south. We're all in this together, and this is a narrative of unleashing the creative potential of those that are at the front lines of uh, climate impact. Um, so I, I think broadly, if we look at the panel, I've got a full panel here, so I'm going to ask my panel to try and stick as much to the timelines as possible. Gabriella here is going to be flashing a time card or telling you to... Uh, start wrapping up uh, when your time has come. So please, if I can ask you to, to stick to your time of about five minutes uh, to seven minutes if you have to in your initial interventions. And then we're going to try and take as much interactive discussion as possible. And the way we have it here, we have uh, three speakers who are very well equipped to describe the challenge that we're facing. So we have the Honorable Minister Sam Chip Torres, Minister of Water and Environment from Uganda. Uh, we have a representative from the uh, uh, government of Tanzania, Ms. Lucy Sendi, and we have Beth uh, Chetekwa Biti, who is the Deputy Director of Slum Dwellers International. These are organizations uh, and, and uh, countries and governments that are at the front line of these impacts. So what I'm going to do is take uh, interventions from them. We're going to then stop and take a few questions to make it interactive, and then move on to the rest of the panel to describe some of the responses. So we have uh, people from the Adaptation Fund, we have a DFID representative, we have uh, insurance sector, Willis Towers Watson, and we have the Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency Partnership uh, representative. And I will introduce those uh, people to you as they uh, uh, have their, t their uh, turns to speak. So I'm going to start off then, if, if, if I can, with the Honorable uh, Minister, uh, Ms. Minister Sh Sam Chitoris from uh, the uh, Minister of uh, Water Environment in, in Uganda. Uh, Minister, you've been, you've been Cabinet Minister uh, for Water Environment in Uganda since 2016. You've also served on the Nile River Council uh, of Ministers, so not an easy task. You're well equipped with dealing with complex issues. Now, if, if I look at some of the statistics, I see that the Green Climate Fund says that they're uh, investing about $700 million in Uganda. I look at the Global Environment Facility, and I see they've approved $500 million for Uganda. 
But when I look deeper into the, the list of projects, I see that most of these projects are being implemented by UN agencies. So, Minister, it would be great to hear from you. I think you're well equipped to uh, describe to us whether the climate finance that you're receiving, one, is enough to uh, uh, meet the challenges you're facing, but also if it is actually reaching the people, the communities that need it the most. Uh, Minister, over to you. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I would like, first of all, to thank the Mayor of London for convening this very important conference. I would like also to thank the government of UK and the IIED for, for inviting us to participate in this very important discussion. As we are all aware, scientific evidence has now clearly confirmed that climate change is real and with us. I think all of us agree, except perhaps one gentleman in Washington who doesn't agree. But I think all of us are convinced that climate change is real. In Uganda, we have learned painfully that climate change is real and it is impacts are devastating. In 2010, landslides on Mount Elgon killed over 40 people. This is in the Mount Elgon area of the country. In 2016, many other people were killed in the same mountain on the other side of the mountain in Bulambuli district. That is uh, near where I come from. I also come from Mount Elgon. And then 20. 17, 2019, just a few months ago, the same landslides killed about eight people in the same area. Now, government tried to relocate, to relocate these people. In fact, there are over 10,000 people who require to be relocated to safer areas. But so far, we have only been able to move about 100 people. Because you have to provide housing, you have to provide water, you have to provide electricity, roads, schools. So these people are still in those uh, areas. And the government is doing all they can to move them. But because the resource envelope is small, we cannot do this at a go. The frequency of fl droughts. We have been experiencing a lot of drought. And some of you may, aware, may be aware that, that uh, Uganda is dependent on rain-fed agriculture. 98% of our farms depend on rain. We wait for God to irrigate our farms. And somebody was telling me this morning, what I was telling him, he said, even God needs help. <laughs> so this, we need irrigation. We have uh, produced an irrigation master plan for the country, but this requires a lot of money to, to, to implement. But we have started. We have started, we have, we have got, uh, we have started a few irrigation schemes, in fact, small irrigation schemes, which we expect that 
some of our citizens with the means can replicate them on their farms. But we urgently need irrigation. Although our emissions are almost negligible, uh, we produce 0.1% of the world's greenhouse gases. Although, although this is almost negligible, some of the activities we undertake in our day to today, day to day in the, in the country, our, our people undertake exacerbate the problem. Electricity and uh, gas is beyond the reach of many people. So our people are forced to, to use firewood for cooking. In fact, the use of firewood for cooking, I mean, the use of firewood and, and uh, building materials has reduced, reduced our forest cover from 24% in the 1990s to now about 9%. This is a very serious problem. And uh, although we have a lot of electricity, it is still expensive because uh, some of the international companies that helped us to to put up these dams, charge the exorbitant uh, amounts of money, and uh, we, the gov government has to pay. The people have to pay this money within a certain time. That is why electricity is still expensive. Uganda's welcoming policy towards refugees has also created problems. We have, uh, we have over one million refugees in Uganda. And uh, you know these refugees come without anything. So if they want to cook, they have to depend on uh, the trees. If they want to build, they have to depend on the trees. And these ones have even contributed a lot to deforestation in the country. <coughs> Another problem we have faced is with is the Chinese introduced paddy rice. Before that, we, we did not produce rice in the country. But when the Chinese came, they introduced paddy rice. The consequences of this are that our wetlands have been invaded. The wetlands have been invaded not only by the Chinese, but also now by Ugandans who have uh, invaded the wetlands to grow rice. And uh, it is, it is, the government has been uh, thinking of evicting these people from the wetlands, but you cannot simply evict somebody without providing alternative uh, livelihood. So we are trying to look for money to see how we can compensate these people so that our wetlands, our wetlands can be freed from encroachment. These are, and many others, are eliminated in our NDCs. Our ambition is to decrease our greenhouse gases, gas emissions, by 22% by 2030. So, when the international community pledged that they would provide $100 billion as climate fi finance, we're all excited. We thought now we would deal with this problem of climate change. However, as you all know, money has not been forthcoming. 
So we expect the international community, we expect the international community to fulfill this obligation. Now, we have a problem with this money. When, even when this money is available, there is a big problem with it. Accessing it is a nightmare. It is very difficult to access climate finance. Very, very difficult. The, apart from the fact that uh, most least developed, least developed countries don't have the knowledge and expertise to prepare bankable projects, apart from that, the accreditation process leaves a lot to be desired. You know, before you access some of this money, you are expected to be accredited. And uh, this process of accreditation, accreditation is extremely long and cumbersome. The financial institutions demand a lot of documents and, 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 and so many you give this the asking for the another it is no wonder that sometimes we abandon the whole exercise and, and decide and opt to use uh, some of these uh, Inter intermediary intermediaries, such as UNDP. For instance, uh, we had we we, have, we used the, uh, the UNDP to get money from GCF, Green Climate Fund. Now, when this money is availed, when when this uh, intermediary such as UNDP get this money. They normally charge between 10 to 20 percent as commission. So that one, 10 to 20 percent goes to these institutions. And then Part of this money is used to pay consultants. And when it reaches the, 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 the country, like for instance, when it reached Uganda, expensive vehicles are bought. In fact, as a minister, I've been making a lot of noise, but they tell me it is in the contract. Very expensive vehicles are bought so that what really reaches the communities is probably 10% of, of, of the money. What reaches, what really trickles down to the community is probably about 10%. The rest of the money has been taken by these uh, institutions, when it reaches national governments, those ones want to buy vehicles. Instead of using a pickup, they want to use land cruisers, big land cruisers. In fact, in my ministry, I use a smaller vehicle. I use a smaller vehicle than my technical people. Because they are the ones who control the money. For us politicians, they give you a vehicle for you. They know that we are temporary. At any time, you can leave office. And you know, for us, every five years, we have elections. And uh, Uganda's history is that uh, members of parliament, uh, very few survive. After five years, 90% are thrown out. 
So these technical people know that uh, <laughs> the hammer is coming for us. In fact, uh, in the next one year, we shall be held, having elections, and I think I'm on my way out. <laughs> Yes. Uh, I wonder if we can ask you to start wrapping up. Oh, oh. If you don't. Sorry, sorry, sorry. I was enjoying myself. <laughs> <laughs> I was enjoying myself. <laughs> so in the in light of the above challenges, we feel that uh, we should not lament. Least developing. Uh, developing countries, developed countries should also part, uh, uh, ensure that they participate in, they contribute to reducing the effects of climate change. It should be a, part a partnership between these developed countries and uh, our friends from the developed world. We should all have a partnership, we contribute, we also contribute, we should not always, in fact, what, what, I, what, we are, what I was when discussing this morning with somebody was saying, now, we, we can be able to get money from our budgets. We can mobilize our people, for instance, to do certain things. In Uganda, for example, our country is mountainous. But we can mobilize our people to, to have what they call terracing. This can be done. We can also mobilize our people to plant trees. For instance, our government provides about 20 million trees every year, free of charge. Our people can plant trees. So what we need to, to do is we people should play our part as third world countries. With, the, with our efforts being complemented by the developed world. So let me stop there. Thank you very Thank you so much. much uh, Thank you very much for that uh, very good description. And, and, and ending off, I think, on a, on a great point, which I, I think is the essence of the Sustainable Development Goals, to move away from a world where the global north is funding development in the, in the global south to one where we're working on this together. It's a partnership that we're all working on together. And you uh, describe some of the challenges of uh, getting money onto the ground where, where it matters. So I'm going to turn now to Ms. Lucy Sendi, who's representing the uh, Tanzanian government. And uh, Lucy was a previous deputy director of economic and productive, uh, um, uh, in, sorry, previous director in the Department of uh, um, Economic and Productive uh, Sectors and now is a senior climate change advisor to that group. She also advises the least developed uh, countries group. So Lucy, perhaps you can give us an explanation from the Tanzanian perspective. Are you facing similar challenges to what the minister has just described here? Uh, thank you, facilitator, uh, moderator, for, for this opportunity. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Tanzania is uh, one of the least developing countries faces similar challenges. And um, the Honorable uh, Minister uh, from Uganda and also from the Gambia have uh, clearly outlined what are the challenges of adaptation in countries like Tanzania, Uganda, and Gambia. But I just wanted to add more challenges specifically to Tanzania. Tanzania is a big country, but 56% uh, of Tanzania is dry land. So you find that communities of pastoralists and farmers uh, make their living from rain-fed agriculture and also from uh, rain-fed livestock keeping. So uh, uh, this uh, uh, climate is also uh, influenced by different patterns of rainfall, increasing temperatures, uh, and also incidences of drought and floods. But the most important thing is that Tanzania depends on agriculture for its uh, economic development, and it, uh, about 65% of the workforce uh, is employed in agriculture, and most of them are women and youth. So the vulnerabilities in terms of gender uh, dynamics is also uh, huge. 
So this makes Tanzania and the other developing countries uh, to be threatened by climate change. And not only on the, uh, their livelihoods, but also on the nation's ability uh, to fulfill its own uh, international obligations such as the Sustainable Development Goal. So a country like Tanzania, Uganda, or Gambia must take urgent action. And uh, we have heard that the governments and their people should also think on how to contribute, uh, on how to uh, uh, develop interventions that will bring resilience to their people. I want to talk about financing because financing for climate change is a big problem. And for a country like Tanzania, which has developed its uh, national climate change strategy, it needs about 500 uh, million US dollar per year, plus its own resources. But from 2000 up to now, the development and international communities in Tanzania has only recorded 150 million US dollar of support. So you can see how the, the gap is. And we have also been made aware of the long processes of the uh, big uh, climate change funds like the GCF or maybe the adaptation fund. But then most of our countries end up being accredited for the small or micro uh, size. And this is about 10 or not more than 50 million US dollars per project. And most of the projects will be for three uh, to five years. So uh, what I want to say is that there is a significant finance gap and this should be overcome by the governments themselves and also the other partners as soon as possible. I would also want to share a little bit on the Life Wear initiative and that Tanzania uh, puts its support behind the Life Wear initiative because most of the initiatives in this uh, initiative, uh, they are the ones which we are currently doing. So we, we can uh, uh, relate ourselves to the Life Wear it talks about decentralized climate finance, talks about social protection, talks about uh, rapid transit, talks about all the other projects which are also doing in our country. So we think maybe this is a, a, a very good initiative for us. It is our own, own bread, and we think if it is supported, then we are sure that we'll make some huge steps. Uh, in terms of uh, local climate finance, Tanzania is implementing a project which is known as uh, Decentralized Climate Finance Mechanism. And uh, Tanzania, through the President's Office, Regional Administration, and Local Government, is working with a consortia of uh, national and international and local partners to make sure that money is taken where it matters. And uh, this mechanism has been piloted in a few districts, but it's a, it has already shown good successes uh, where the districts or local governments have been able to establish uh, district level adaptation funds. And also they've been able to establish uh, community committees and also electing community leadership. And also, uh, the project has as assisted communities to use resilience planning. Uh, communities have been involved in planning, and also communities have been made aware on how to use uh, weather information services. So we think that building on this pilot, uh, Tanzania is on the right track to make sure that money goes where it is needed most. And Tanzania, in implementing these projects, uh, it has made commitments. It has made commitments through the project to make sure that the finances which goes to communities is about 
70% is being prioritized by communities and 20% <coughs> is being prioritized by the local government authorities for actual investments. And only 10% is used for administration. So we have tested this and uh, we have managed to uh, develop about 35 projects. The project has ended in the first phase, but the projects are going on well under the supervision of the local government authorities and management of local communities. So we think this can be done. And we think if there are, there are any other countries who would want to implement a mechanism which ensures that the communities are empowered to make their own decisions, to plan and make priorities, then I think maybe we can talk about the decentralized climate finance. Let me conclude my talk by saying that this uh, decentralized climate finance is also implemented in four uh, three other countries. It is implemented in Senegal, Mali, and Kenya. And I know there are other countries which are also in the process of uh, uh, using this mechanism. So what I want to say is that there are many lessons that we have learned, and uh, this include uh, the delivering of local climate finance uh, to improve the scale and also the effectiveness, and also to uh, help governments to access and distribute in already existing financial management architecture. Tanzania has shown that it has the ambition and the capability to be a world leader in delivering effective, appropriate adaptation initiative that have a potential to be transformative. And we think it is time that the changes are made into these international funds. The changes are made into our partners, the international organization, to make sure that money gets where it matters. Business as usual is not working, and I think this is time for real change. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Lucien. So a, a very clear example of, of how we work at a, a local government level or a sub-national uh, level to build the capacity of those uh, institutions to be able to accept uh, finance. So great uh, initiative and very positive to see that you hear that it is working well and it's re replicable, Lucy. So thank you so much for that. Now we're going to move on to uh, grassroots uh, civil society organizations. So we're going to move to Beth uh, Shitekwa Biti, who's the Deputy Director for Slum Dwellers International. Now, SDI is described as a global social movement of the urban poor um, and a network of community based organizations across uh, more than 30 different countries. And I think my experience of uh, Slum Dwellers International, what they do so well, is having their feet on the ground, being embedded in local grassroots civil society organizations, but still being able to reach uh, at a global level and, and to be able to engage in uh, global processes. So wonderful to have an organization like that. Sheila Patel, the founder and, and head of SDI, is on the Global Commission of uh, Adaptation that was spoken about in the previous, um, uh, previous panel. So from your side, Beth, uh, your, 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 your organization is at the forefront. Uh, I mean, w what are the challenges that you're seeing in terms of the, the funding reaching the, your organizations that you work with? Thank you, John. And uh, it's lovely to be here. Uh, it's great to always come to London when the weather is kind to us Africans. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, I think as SDI, what we have done over the last 20 years is to create aggregations of the even poor across uh, the countries where we are working in to develop very systematic processes that look to not only developing uh, conscious and uh, uh, collective mechanisms to address local challenges. Uh, one of our flagship programs is around data collection where communities of the urban poor collect data around in their communities, and they use this information to negotiate with local authorities around uh, service provision or, or tenure security. The information collected not only shows uh, sort of like deprivation, so for instance, what toilets are not there or what tenure is not there, 
but also looks at what adaptation uh, strategies uh, people are em employing or what challenges can be attributed to climate change that are resulting from, from uh, the, the deprivations that people face. So one aspect that I spoke to in, in a meeting that we had earlier in the morning is around how sort of like the nexus between solutions to climate change and full-scale evictions for communities that are living in in uh, communities, in, 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 uh, in uh, sort of like spaces that might not, might be perceived as uh, un, unfavorable. The, uh, uh, the minister from Uganda spoke about communities that have gone on to wetlands. And unfortunately, in some cases, when, when, when government seeks to address these challenges, it results in full-scale evictions. So for, for, for us, the data we are collecting around uh, looking at climate change is not only looking to see what is not there, but also how can communities in partnership across uh, the divide with city governments, with uh, development agency, can actually develop solutions to climate change that do not result in further uh, shocks being visited upon already vulnerable uh, communities. I think uh, if we, I, I like the, the, this tagline leading from the, from the front and you can, you can uh, interpret front as two, like as in, in front or as in a front line where the action or where the, the fight is, where the war is. And uh, if we are to be true to the ambitions of the SDGs, we require ambitious uh, programs and new ways of doing things, new architecture. I think the last uh, two uh, panelists have spoken about the, the inadequacies of the existing uh, in, uh, architecture around our climate finance. Um, and we see this, or, or if governments, for instance, can't access climate finance, uh, how, you can imagine how communities of the urban poor or, uh, coastal or uh, associations of uh, pastoralists would, would fare in those instances. So we, we think that there is actually an agency to develop an architecture that can actually deliver to people who are actually doing something on the ground. And uh, it is our contention that uh, people who have to live with these issues adapt anyway. They have to, they have to, they have no choice. So if there's a flood, they are going to build a makeshift bridge. If there's a fire, they are going to find a way to address that. But there is an opportunity for all the stakeholders that are there to actually contribute to changes that are actually significant and are at scale and lasting. And I think this is where we have an issue and that this is where our actions and our minds need to, to come together to figure out why if everyone agrees that resources need to be in the hands of those that are most affected, why is it not happening? Where are the shortfalls? Why is it, you, you, you would be hard pressed to find anyone who would argue with you if you said, pastoralists require to be equipped with resources, whether they are financial or whether it's a capacity to be able to, to address their everyday challenges. You would be hard pressed to find anyone who would argue with you to say that the urban poor who now are a billion living in slums require uh, resources and capacity and partnerships to be able to address the issues that they face on an everyday basis. But perhaps our challenge as a collective is to look at what kind of, what is it that we need to unblock these issues that are at the, at the fore of what is locking these resources that have been made available but are not getting to where they need to get. And um, I think one of our tagline is SDI has always been that the resources of the urban poor matter. So none of the poor from the world are coming as begging. begging. They, they have resources. They have the Wairo Commission, who are our partner in, in, in this conversation, have an adaptation fund that has been giving loans to communities to address incrementally small uh, local actions at the community level. SDI set up uh, about 10 years ago an urban poor fund 
uh, where, where we, put, we, have, we were able to get a 10 million grant and we have managed to leverage it to nearly 100 million now in land, in housing, in sanitation. So they obviously are models across there that actually can, can demonstrate scale. We have set up city funds where local authorities who are cash strapped are able to put in even the smallest that, that, that they can to, to, to leverage resources that the urban poor themselves have, uh, have, uh, have um, set aside. My sense is for us to move forward, we have to think kind of like to put all this issue on its head a bit and see how, how, how do the urban poor communities give each other, or I keep saying urban poor communities because that's where I'm coming from, but I'm, I would like to include pastoralists, I would like to include all these other social movements that are working on natural resources. How, how do they use resources? And they don't ask for massive amounts. These are, these are very small incremental loans that are managed at the local level and that can create change incrementally. And I think they, these systems need to be flexible, they need to be easy, they need to, to trust that there is some accountability in those local communities, that communities can actually hold each other accountable for resources and that they have systems and that, and this includes local authorities as well these systems need to trust that that process can, if it's not there, it can be built through peer learning. If it's there, it can be enhanced and made better. And I think this is how we can kind of like shift this forward. And I will reiterate again, we communities collect data. They know what, where, where the what, what spots are, they, they experience that, they have this information, and there is a, 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 an opportunity to build on that capacity with new knowledge, with new technology. I think it's a travesty that there is this money that's sitting somewhere and it's not being used or it's not being accessed. And I think we have to challenge ourselves and ask ourselves, why are we not moving? Why, is it, why are we not making this? change if there's this agency? Why, is it, why are we not making the change? And I, I believe um, in SDI and our partners, Wairo and Wibo are here. We are very willing and open to move this sort of like ship forward as it were. Thank you. Excellent. So that's a very interesting topic of these uh, local funds, these frontier funds, I think they're referred to in many ways, that are, drawn, that are built from grassroots organizations that are able to then provide loans and, and funds, micro loans and, and, and micro funds at, at the level that it matters. And uh, to be able to promote those funds is, is a, I think, a, a massive um, opportunity for us. But I presume, Beth, that this not only requires movement on, on your side, on the civil society organization, but also providers of capital into those funds. It will it'll require two sides of that argument to come right. Yep. Right, so I'm going to break now because we've heard now three speakers uh, outlining the challenge of getting finances to where it matters the most. And uh, take any questions from the audience at the moment. I have one right up here off the bat. Over to you, sir. One of the main themes is that there isn't enough um, uh, funding. However, when we look at uh, military spending and how much money is uh, fuels the military industrial complexes in, in all of our uh, countries, we notice that not only does it take up a lot of money, but they are among the biggest um, emitters of uh, carbon dioxide. Um, so my question is especially to uh, uh, our guests who sit with the fellow secretaries of defense. Can you look them in the eye and say that you must reduce your carbon emissions and your military activities? Can we also look our politicians, especially in the global north, in the eye and tell them to stop supporting fascist military regimes for corporate benefits, the same corporate benefits that have helped us reach where we are today? Thank you. Good. Very fundamental question. Um, let me see if there are any other questions uh, that we could take before we go on. Any, any further questions? I've got two at the back. We'll just take these three for now, if you don't mind, and then we'll move on to, to the rest of our, our, our speakers as well. So just the... 
Hello, good afternoon. Mark Harvey from the Resurgence Urban Resilience Trust. Um, I'm wondering if the panelists think that there is something to be learned from the, the more agile uh, mechanisms coming out of the forecast-based financing sector or even the insurance sector, or do you think actually because they're often linked to time-sensitive events, that they're less suited to tackling some of the kind of the the longer term, uh, perhaps uh, less time sensitive kind of adaptation issues that we're also discussing on the panel. Good, thank you so much. And I think we, we have someone on the panel who will love to take that up. Uh, Simon, I'm sure you'd love to take it up in a moment. Uh, right, one more question over there. Do you want this one? It's that better. There we go, <laughs> perfect. Uh, my name is John Sword. I'm with the Bretton Woods Project here in London. Um, I'd like to ask the panelists who've spoken if they have any reflections on the role of the World Bank and other multilateral development banks within the sort of climate finance architecture, and in particular, this issue of getting fun funds to the front line. Um, I'd really welcome any thoughts you might have on whether they're playing a productive role and how they could be uh, how they could better serve the LDCs from your perspective. Perfect. Thank you so much. So those were three uh, very interesting questions, starting from the amount of money that we allocate to military spending to the use of more agile forecast-based um, financing mechanisms and the role of the World Bank. What I'm going to suggest now is that we move on to the rest of our panelists, and the rest of the panelists should be thinking both of what was said by the previous panelists in terms of uh, setting up the challenge, but also thinking of these uh, questions that have been posed from the uh, audience in, in your response. Uh, so if I, if I could move on then. Farai, I'd like to move to you. So Farai uh, Madziwa is the coordinator of the readiness program at the Adaptation <coughs> Fund. Now the Adaptation Fund's readiness program helps to strengthen the capacity of national and regional implementing entities. So these entities that uh, the Honorable Minister spoke about, uh, Lucy spoke about, these uh, entities that are implementing uh, financing activities to be able to receive and, and manage these climate finance. I also know in my home country, Farai, you have a small grants program, which has been very successful providing micro grants to uh, where, it, where it is needed the most. Farai, how would you respond to some of the challenges and what is the Adaptation Fund doing to respond to some of these challenges? Well, <coughs> thank you very much, Dion, and um, uh, thank you for the invitation to come and participate in, in, in this panel. Um, I'm, I'm not going to respond directly uh, because I want to give a little bit more information about the Adaptation Fund and what the Adaptation Fund does. Uh, and, and through that, I'm hoping that uh, I'll also address uh, a lot of the issues and, and, and challenges mentioned by the previous speakers. So the Adaptation Fund um, was established in 2008 under the Kyoto Protocol. It's a fund established under the uh, United Nations Convention on Climate Change. So it's a constituted body under the, the, the UN Convention. Uh, as of January of this year, the Adaptation Fund uh, is also uh, or has also been formally serving the Paris Agreement. Um, and there are only um, four constituted bodies that are serve, formally serving the Paris Agreement, um, the others being the Green Climate Fund, um, the Least Developed Country Fund, Special Climate Change Fund, uh, both under the Global Environment Facility and also the Adaptation Fund is the fourth one. So the Adaptation Fund finances concrete projects and programs uh, that are based on country needs, um, views and priorities and that also help vulnerable communities in developing countries adapt to climate change. And the primary strengths of the Adaptation Fund uh, is direct access mod modality. I'll get into a little bit more about that later. It's streamlined and efficient project cycle where we have a results-based project implementation and disbursement uh, process. Uh, we also have partnership with civil society and in particular, uh, we involve civil society in direct engagement um, on project monitoring. Uh, and also the Adaptation Fund's ability to accommodate innovative funding sources. So the overall portfolio of the Adaptation Fund uh, is that to date we, uh, we have committed over half a billion US dollars uh, to some 84 plus concrete projects that are implemented on the ground by developing countries. And to date, 
the Adaptation Fund Board has approved a little over 303 million US dollars to finance 24 concrete and localized climate change adaptation and resilience projects in least developed countries. Uh, and these are in Africa and Asia. The projects implemented by the LDCs are all country driven and are based on the needs, views, and priorities of the LDCs. And in addition, four of these projects um, are under implementation via our direct access modality. And what the direct access modality does is it enables national implementing entities, which are entities identified and chosen by uh, the governments of developing countries themselves to directly access financing from the adaptation fund and to manage this financing, all aspects of this fund uh, um, financing, including identification of projects, uh, project design, implementation, and monitor monitoring. So the whole project life cycle is under the direct uh, management and supervision uh, of the national governments, if you will, of national implementing entities. And the Adaptation Fund was the first fund um, under the United Nations Convention uh, to operationalize this direct access modality um, uh, globally. And now, of course, we are also talking about enhanced direct access, which gives a little bit more control um, uh, in decision making to uh, the recipients of funding to actually make funding decisions to local uh, uh, submitted projects and proposals. And the Small Grants Project in South Africa, for example, is one of those um, uh, projects that are implementing enhanced direct access. So through the readiness program of the Adaptation Fund, the fund provides readiness and capacity building support to strengthen the capacity of developing countries to receive and manage climate financing and to help national implementing entities because these are the entities that can access uh, that can use the direct access modality to receive and manage um, uh, adaptation financing and to navigate the fund's project life cycle. So the readiness program upholds the adaptation fund's inclusive driven process uh, in its approach to delivering readiness and capacity building support um, in an effective and sustained manner. So in addition, the readiness program also provides knowledge transfer and learning between entities uh, and with climate change stakeholders to enhance direct access to adaptation finance. The fund is constantly evolving. It was established in 2008, uh, but it has been changing in response to the needs and the dynamic nature of capacity gaps and challenges, some of which we've heard here today, in accessing adaptation finance, and particularly those challenges and gaps faced by LDCs and SIDS. Uh, and so in October of 2017, the Adaptation Fund Board adopted the fund's medium-term strategy. This is a five-year strategy running from 2018 to 2022. And this strategy emphasizes and is anchored on three strategic pillars, which are action, innovation, and learning. And there are four cross-cutting themes uh, that underpin uh, the strategy. One of these cross-cutting themes is um, long-term institutional and technical capacity for effective adaptation. Now, the importance of this strategy is that it opens, uh, it has enabled also new funding opportunities and new funding windows uh, for developing countries. And some of these are uh, innovation grants uh, that basically developing countries can access to, uh, if I can put it uh, uh, maybe bluntly, to, to test out and experiment on adaptation initiative and projects on the ground. And I think the Adaptation Fund Board um, is one of the very few boards that have accepted this risk and liability that such innovative projects have a chance of failure or success, and is willing to take on that risk and make this funding available to, to, to pilot these new innovative approaches. Other funding windows include the enhanced direct access window I mentioned. We have learning grants that are part of this um, uh, strategy, uh, and also project scale up. So the Adaptation Fund Board recognizes that our projects uh, that are being funded have got a cap of $10 million. Uh, and there are these project scale-up grants that are available to help developing countries start thinking about scaling up, perhaps approaching other funders, uh, including the Green Climate Fund, bilateral cooperation, and other sources of financing to enable already implemented projects under the Adaptation Fund to be scaled up. So I'll just very briefly, I've got a minute left, and I'll very briefly just give a snapshot of the support resources available uh, to least developed countries and developing countries in general from the Adaptation Fund 
uh, to support readiness and capacity building uh, targeted towards adaptation projects. So we have grant-based support and we have non-grant-based support. We have a number of grants, uh, including South-South Cooperation grants, which are supposed to facilitate peer-to-peer uh, uh, capacity building in order to access climate finance or adaptation finance from the fund. We have a readiness support package which uh, does essentially the same but offers a whole suite of tools and instruments to support developing countries to access money from the fund. I heard a little bit about the challenges of, of um, attaining or obtaining accreditation with the funds, uh, with the adaptation fund in this particular two particular grants are uh, supposed to enable and facilitate and provide support to access funds from the Adaptation Fund. We also have grants to support project development, uh, including technical assistance grants to comply with environmental and social uh, safeguards and the policy of the fund. Um, and we have non-grant based support, which includes regional and training workshops to support accreditation and project support. And I'm also very happy to actually just mention that the Adaptation Fund in 2017 held a global workshop for LDCs in Ethiopia, in Addis Ababa, Addis Ababa to discuss access to climate finance by least developed countries uh, and project, uh, the development pro of projects and putting together pipelines uh, that can be funded by the Adaptation Fund on adaptation. We also hold webinars, seminars, country exchanges. We had a country exchange in Chile um, where we brought in, it was South to South country exchange and, and, and the purpose is to learn and exchange information and knowledge on adaptation projects and accessing adaptation finance uh, through some of the instruments available from the fund. And then very lastly, very quickly, lastly, we have a community of practice that we have facilitated by developing countries, and this is also in partnership with other funds like the Green Climate Fund, um, and, and we are in partnership also with the Paris Committee on Capacity Building uh, on this community of practice to provide information and set up a platform for learning and sharing uh, for developing countries to come together and discuss some of these issues and challenges they are facing, and the Adaptation Fund is very much involved and committed uh, to, to at least trying to address some of these challenges and work together with developing countries uh, to increase the amount of finance flowing to LDCs and developing countries, and of course to support um, the, the, an increase in the quality and number of projects uh, that are being implemented in developing countries. So thank you very much. Thank I'll you so there. much, uh, Fry. Um, <laughs> excellent examples, and uh, I really like what you're doing in terms of uh, decreasing the, uh, the onerous uh, requirements in terms of application building capacity but specifically the points you made around risk appetite, because I think that's important, that it's not only about capacity, it's also about risk appetite of uh, uh, many of these uh, donor organizations uh, and, and funds. So with that, I'd like to move over to Malcolm Bredeau, who is a uh, senior advisor to the UK Department of International Development. And uh, as many of you will know, DFID is a, a major invest investor in development globally. Uh, I think we estimate uh, in excess of 10 billion pounds per year, um, so a major investor. And uh, so, Malcolm, just uh, you know, over to you. How is, how is DFID taking into account some of these challenges and perhaps shifting its risk appetite to be able to get money uh, to where it matters? Okay, thank you very much and good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm going to say, I'm going to talk about four things fairly superficially because I don't have much time. So first is the finance and the gaps that we have. The second is, why do we need to change the system we have at the moment? The third is what we're going to do about it, especially through the Climate Summit. Uh, and the fourth is why the Life AR initiative fits in and why I find it so exciting. So I think that first off, if you look at uh, global warming, we all know massive, uh, you all know the numbers. Uh, but certainly mitigation finance is running at about four or five times the amount of adaptation uh, about adaptation funding. And, and costs of adaptation in developing countries, 140 billion a year, 300 billion a year by 2030. That's a big spread. I'll come back to that. There's a big spread there. And also, of course, natural hazards, which we see uh, the global increase at 1.5 trillion in 2003 to 2013. Uh, of damages for, from natural hazards. Now, that's a very large amount of money, 
in addition, uh, the rest of the world doesn't stop, with about 90 trillion going to go into infrastructure in the next 15 years. And we know we get a roughly one to four return on making that infrastructure resilient. So in terms of actually shifting into making sure that c countries and people can adapt and shifting to make sure that investment is fit for purpose for the future is tremendously important. But delivering that impact isn't easy. It isn't easy because we're not dealing with simple things that can be dealt with by one project in some linear way of thinking. We're dealing with a very complex system. And every time you change one bit, all the rest changes as well. And that's not easy. So the first thing is the political commitment to engage with that complexity and push change through cannot be, un and the need for that can't be underestimated. And certainly one of the things that DFID has learned is that making those connections from national to regional to local to community to individuals is critical. And that flow of information both up and down the chain is what is needed to make things actually work. So for many countries, so in many countries there's a degree of support that will be needed to help this process go forward, technical uh, and support to actually make things happen, down to you know, make, helping people travel to, to provide uh, news to local people. So Life AR, I think, is very critical in helping to enable that control, to help to enable that system to thrive whereby countries can put in place the infrastructure to engage with the complexity that they need. Because Lo local decisions and getting engaging with local people and what they do is critical. And I will tell you one story from a long time ago. I came across a farmer. He was breaking terraces on his land. And I said, why, why are you breaking the terraces? Well, he said, first year of a terrace, you lose about 20% of yield as the terrace establishes. I need to feed my family next year. And besides, he said, every year there's food for work to build terraces. So in the kind of top-down, siloed projects that end up not talking to reality have litter the history of development. And that has got to change. And there is only, the only one way of changing that is by talking to people uh, and actually having to shift the dial on the way things are done. So that's why the UK, with Egypt, Malawi, Bangladesh, Netherlands, St. Lucia, are leading on adaptation and resilience for the forthcoming climate summit. We want to shift the dial on the way business is done in delivering adaptation and resilience. One of those is scaling up finance. We need to get more finance in there. And that's both public finance and private finance as well. There's no point investing in a bridge that's going to fall over in 10 minutes. Um, also, the important about saying, well, where is this, how are these decisions being made? How is climate factoring into decisions? And are the systems in place to enable communities and countries to make the right decisions? No more farmers breaking terraces because that's the best way to get uh, the maximum out of a system that are on offer. We also need to make sure that we deal with natural hazards. I said, you know, 40 trillion or whatever it was, can't remember the number myself now, um, in natural hazard damage. That's a misleading figure. If you flood a sub suburb of Miami, I mean, the, the leather seats of those Maseratis will never be the same again, and they cost a huge amount uh, to put re right together. You flood a suburb of Delhi, a lot of people die, but the actual, the actual uh, monetary uh, loss is not, not so much. So that's Im an important distinction to make. People's lives really matter. And also making sure that we uh, invest in the environment for food and water in the summit wants to. And also through all this to make sure that the tools on data and technology are available to help all this to happen. And I think for me the political signal that Life AR gives where the least developed countries will stand up and show leadership and say, we know the kinds of changes that we need to make. We invite people to start being much more effective in the way that they deliver 
uh, on tackling climate change and building adaptation and resilience is potentially an extremely powerful message. And we would like to put that at the heart of the Climate Summit because making a difference with people rather than doing it to them is the way forward. The Life AR project has come up a number of times and the excellent project of bringing together the LDC group and driving an agenda from that group and uh, inviting donors and, and others to support that agenda. So uh, thank you very much, uh, Malcolm. So we're now going to move over to Simon. Uh, Simon, you, you uh, wear many hats. Uh, you, one of those is a strategic advisor to Willis Towers. Watson is a a, a, quite an important player in the insurance sector as well as risk management sector. And when we think of the insurance uh, sector, we always think of this uh, rising insurance gap. So a bit what uh, Malcolm was speaking about is that the, uh, the economic losses versus the insured losses is growing. And, and uh, you know, it always puzzles me that this is a massive market opportunity that surely uh, the insurance sector will be, sh should be uh, capitalizing on. But you also told me before the break that insurance uh, is uh, an important part of de-risking capital investments. So insurance can be a key player in getting investments uh, into the places where it is needed under the right conditions. Would you like to give us some thoughts, uh, Simon? Sure. I, and I'm actually going to start with, uh, with something that, that you didn't mention, Dion, which is that um, you know, Will Willis and, and our peers in the insurance industry, um, about 25% of Willis's business, and Willis intermediates insurance, it doesn't sell insurance directly, it, it doesn't hold risk, um, but about 25% of our business is linked to climate risk. So we are helping, 25% um, of our business is directly helping corporates and public sector manage climate risk around the world. So, and the tools we, we need to use to do that effectively are the very same tools, the quantitative analytical tools that you need to manage climate risk in the development context and adaptation. And so I think what, one of the really big points that I want to make is that um, understanding risk and then having a good uh, framework to make smart investments in adaptation, which are gonna make a big difference in the medium to long term under different climate scenarios as well, um, is, is really important. And there are literally a thousand people um, across our company who are doing this on a day-to-day -day basis. And so I think that's something significant that the insurance industry can bring to this, uh, to this space. Um, the second point is, is to pick up on your, your point, Dion, is, is unlocking private investment um, requires management of the downside risks of that investment. And if that investment is going into adaptation, then climate risk is going to be part of the equation. And to, to get private investment flows uh, to, 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 to work, um, those, those de-risking tools need to be in place. A big pension fund like the, um, the Ontario Teachers, which was mentioned earlier, um, their normal investment strategy, they, they may get pressure from, um, from the grassroots, to change the way they do things. They're gonna get increasingly get pressure from regulators, et cetera, and the Bank of England here in the UK is leading the way on that um, to, uh, to look at long-term climate risk. Um, but they'll still need to go through their normal investment um, analytics. And so they're not gonna jump in blind into uh, suddenly putting a lot of money into climate adaptation uh, or mitigation, come to that. Um, but if we can provide the, the normal tools that they would expect to see when they're making those investment decisions, and insurance is one of those, or risk management more broadly, then I think that that can help to unlock that, uh, that flow. And uh, to be honest, the you know, public money has got to be part of it, but the trillions of dollars that are, um, that are invested every year by the global private sector, including actually insurance companies. Insurance companies are the second biggest investors uh, in, in the world, it's the class of investors in the world. Um, so, it's really important that we, uh, that we uh, understand how we tap into those, those investments. Um, and then um, the third point I wanted to make was, was some of the, uh, it was mentioned earlier in the first panel about um, kind of cross-learning. And I think em Emma talked about cross-learning on, on adaptation uh, and mitigation from, from south to north. 
um, as well as from north to south. Um, and one of the things I've been working on um, innovative insurance solutions in, in, um, in the Caribbean, in, in Africa, in the Pacific, um, try, trying to bring some new thinking about how insurance can be applied to, uh, to some of the challenges facing the, uh, the, the, the climate vulnerable countries. And we're now seeing that some of those tools are starting to be uh, seen as being useful to fill the insurance gap actually in the developed world, so in North America Wildfire is a very good example. Wildfire risk is, is escalating incredibly quickly in the Western US, um, and there really aren't the tools, the normal insurance tools that would be brought to bear to, uh, to manage that kind of um, situation, both, again, in the public and the private sector. So it's, it's very interesting to see that, that some tools that we've developed, and I have to say the insurance industry is not the most innovative uh, it, um, financial uh, service provider, but, um, but I do think that some of that innova innovation that we've managed to, to deploy in, the, um, in, the, in those developing uh, world countries, especially to address climate risk, are now working their way back into, um, into the uh, developed world as well. So the insurance gap is, is certainly real, but it's, it's real everywhere, and I think the pace of climate change is really, um, is really making that more and more obvious. And then just, just the final, final one, because you asked us to um, address the, the questions of there, and Mark's was, I think, was kind of directly to me. Um, so long-term climate risk is certainly a, a very different from, from, from an insurance perspective from, uh, from sudden onset, so uh, hurricanes, uh, floods, et cetera. Um, but the insurance, another part of the insurance industry uh, covers certain events, covers life insurance. And so some of the thinking around life insurance, we think can be brought to bear to, uh, to, to uh, come up with, with some instruments which may both um, meet, the, meet the needs of uh, kind of long-term climate change um, impacts, but also can all, uh, drive the, um, can incentivize uh, the, the reduction of that overall risk i.e. mitigation of climate, uh, of carbon emissions, um, if we set it up right. And, and that architecture is, is not simple, for sure, but I do think that there are some, um, some lessons from the life insurance industry about how you go about doing that, which we're looking to, uh, to test out a little bit. And we're doing, just to, just to close and, um, and come back to another, another point that was made earlier, which is these, these parallel threads of the, um, of the CBD and the climate COP, and the, um, the impact of climate change on our, on our ecosystems and that, that feedback loop that that then has to exacerbating the, the, the challenges of, of climate risk. And uh, one of the areas we want to, to test out this long-term uh, life, in, let's call it life insurance for, uh, for uh, ecosystems is in, for coral reefs. Um, and we think that there's a, there's a case that, um, that you know, we, we all know reefs are on a short lifespan unless we do something about uh, ocean warming and, and acidification. And, uh, and so we want to we see if there's a way to, uh, to align all of the interests so that we can, uh, we can actually bring that tool to bear. Thank you. Thanks so much, uh, Simon. And uh, I think despite your own remarks about the insurance industry not being the most innovative industry, I think I'm seeing a lot of uh, new innovation coming out, so uh, hoping that we can uh, escalate that. Uh, Sabera, I'm sorry to put you at the last uh, end of a long panel, but um, you represent both the Renewable Energy, Energy Efficiency Partnership as well as a, a specific um, program that you're working on underneath that, which is the Beyond the Grid, or sorry, Beyond the Grid Fund for Zambia. So how are you seeing this and uh, the combination of both public finance and private finance to be able to drive renewable energy uh, expansion in, in Zambia? Right. Um, thank you very much, Dion. Uh, good afternoon to you all. Um, I think that's, a, that's an important question and a debate. I think for a long uh, while, uh, we've been discussing how private sector can fund some of the climate action and climate uh, development agenda, and how it can um, you know, contribute to, uh, to what we're looking at 
uh, from an energy perspective, clean energy uh, agenda. Um, interestingly enough that in Zambia, when you actually look at the rural population, it's very sparsely populated. And so it becomes really difficult for the public sector to provide energy services to the rural populace. Um, the Swedish government uh, then put out a tender to say, how can uh, we design a fund to attract private sector to bring on technological solutions to provide energy services to the rural populace. So grandmother in uh, Imbala, uh, 50, after 50, um, sorry, five decades of independence in Zambia, still doesn't have modern energy services, but is able to make a phone call on a cell phone. So um, how can we emulate what happened with the uh, telecoms industry in the energy sector and provide energy services uh, to the rural populace. And um, what actually happened is that we, we then, um, as, as REAP, were contracted to create a funding mechanism where private sector could access finance to provide those uh, uh, energy services into the rural areas. So Beyond the Grid Fund for Zambia is a results-based financing mechanism um, that, that basically catalyzes public finance to attract um, the private sector to provide energy services into the rural areas where they would not have done uh, that without uh, the, the public finance support. But the public finance support, the way it was actually structured was that um, one of the conditionalities was to attract uh, private sector financing. So um, right now, um, under round one um, of, of the fund, Four companies have been awarded um, about 12 million uh, US dollars. And the 12 million US dollars at the time of contracting actually leveraged from the private sector um, about 20 million. And this is at the time of contracting, not even over the period of the four years of uh, the implementation of the fund, which is an additional over the four years, 24 million. So, the 12 million public finance actually attracted in the market um, a total of uh, 40 plus million dollars into an off-grid space that is very nascent, underdeveloped, um, that the private sector was not uh, really looking at. Um, and that's the, the, the innovation behind it. But in addition to the results-based financing for the private sector, um, one of the other pillars of, of the program is um, the development of a market platform, really understanding where are the challenges, where are the barriers. So it's not just enough to have a financing mechanism or a financing instrument out in the market, but we need to really understand the dynamics of um, you know, the, uh, uh, the challenges, the barriers, how do we go about addressing the challenges and barriers? Are there policy issues? Are there regulatory issues? Is it just a systemic uh, uh, um, difficulty? So in Zambia, what we've done is we've created an off-grid task force, which is represented by uh, government and government agencies, uh, the uh, cooperating partners, as well as the private sector to get a better understanding of what needs to be done. The third pillar of the program is uh, data analytics, and we've got a tool called Edison that plugs into um, the, the software systems of the companies so that we actually understand what's going on. Uh, from a consumer perspective, we understand uh, what, uh, what is the data on, on gender, uh, who's making the decisions in, in um, um, purchasing uh, the, the power that is generated through this private sector. Um, so we, we think that it's, it's a very innovative tool. In the one and a half years that uh, Beyond the Grid Fund has been implemented, uh, we've managed to connect over 600,000 households, and I think that's a huge achievement. Um, and besides the leveraging power of, of the mechanism itself, um, it, it, already, it already has shown 
uh, results. The target for the Swedish government was one million, and we're certainly on track for the four-year period to, uh, to reach that target by 2021. Um, I think there are a lot of, uh, Dion, maybe beyond Beyond, beyond, beyond the grid fund for Zambia, uh, which is now also actually expanding into rest of uh, Africa, going into Mozambique, Liberia, and Burkina Faso. Um, I'd like to just maybe just say, uh, you know, listening to um, uh, the Honorable Minister and, and some of the country uh, issues with regards to, you know, accessing finance, climate finance, I think it really is about creating various different avenues for the climate finance to flow in. Um, yes, it is available, but finance really looks at uh, track record and understanding of how that finance is going to be deployed. A lot of times, and we've been working with the Zambian government as well, um, and in fact, um, uh, the, the, the company that I'm part of um, Lloyd's Financials Limited in Zambia has um, developed the National Climate Change Fund for Zambia. And one of the things that we've looked at in terms of being creative is creating an infrastructure to absorb that kind of financing. And a lot of the times, uh, government seems to think that they, they need to harness all this international finance and be the focal point. But if we open up the, uh, the channels and routes of, uh, of getting a multitude of stakeholders accessing this finance, then I think we will uh, de develop much faster. Um, I think the, the, the other challenge that the uh, uh, minister had, um, had said that most projects are being implemented by different agencies, capacity constraints, capacity issues. Um, again, I think we need to really understand what does that mean? What are those capacity constraints? A lot of countries, LDC countries, when you actually look at their projects, they are wish lists. They are not organized, investable projects. And that's what we need to be able to do. So, Honorable Minister, I think it really is time for us to sit around the table and understand if finance needs to come in, it needs to have proper vehicles, proper projects, and we need to be able to design those. Having a wish list is not convincing enough for that finance to come into, into our countries. That's all I'd like to say. Thank you very much. Thank you, Saber. And um, I think some would say that uh, finance is a bit like uh, water. It, it follows the path of least resistance. And if you, if you create opportunities, investable opportunities, it, it, it will flow. So thank you very much for your inputs. I'm going to open it up now for any uh, final thoughts. I know we're running over time. We're going to have to wrap up uh, pretty soon. Uh, but if there are any final thoughts from the, from the audience in terms of questions to, to the panel, I'd love to take them. Uh, Laurie. I'm Laurie Gehring from the Thompson Reuters Foundation. I thought it was interesting some of the innovation these last two speakers were talking about. You, you talked about insurance. Is it CARICOM or these kind of models that are being used in the West? Or can you tell us a little bit more about how the West, Western US with fire, wildfire risk is looking at the Caribbean and Africa, for examples? And <coughs> I'm just curious how far you think. How many countries are actually ready for this kind of model that you're doing in Zambia? You've just said that there needs to be a, you know, projects that are bankable. How, how, mu how many countries that are in the LDCs have that kind of bankable system now? Excellent. Good. Uh, any other questions uh, to take right now? We've got one at the back there. So we've got a, a, a question for Simon and one to Sabira so far. Yep. Bueno, somos organizaciones comunitarias de base y trabajamos fuertemente lo que es las diferentes plataformas, en especial el Fondo Comunitario de Resiliencia, que ha sido lo que es un trabajo fuerte a nivel de las comunidades, cómo trabajar la adaptación y el cambio climático. A Sabora le voy a hacer unas preguntas en relación al comentario que acaba de hacer ella. 
que los fondos pueden ser manejados en diferentes, en diferentes instituciones y de manera de, de lo que es acceder a estos fondos. Creemos que estamos aquí para plantear un proceso comunitario, cómo podemos hacer una estructura, cómo podemos alinearnos a, a, a acceder a recursos, no solo recursos en el gobierno, porque sabemos perfectamente la corrupción y todos esos procesos que se dan dentro del manejo de los recursos y es muy necesario crear estas plataformas que sí pueden funcionar para lo que es gestionar de recursos comunitarios. Um, so I represent um, community organizations, grassroots community organizations, and we work with a platform that brings together different community um, organizations. Um, Zabira talked at the end about um, funds being available to different um, institutions, there being the importance of making channels um, available um, so that the um, money could be invested um, effectively. Now, we are a grassroots level community. How can we, as grassroots organizations, um, be a part of um, this um, ramification of, of organizations that are going to get access to, to funding, especially when we've got to put the political aspect um, into it? We've got to deal with corruption um, at government level. We got need to work with governments. Our platforms work with governments, but we're, we've got the, the problem of government um, corruption. So how could we... Um, make the changes, do what we would need to do in order to be able to be a part of these multiple channels of potential um, investment. Excellent. Thank you so much. Uh, any further questions? I don't see any, f any further hands. So I'm going to ask uh, Simon for you to, to respond on the, on the issue around the innovation uptake and then Sabira to respond on, on the other two questions. Uh, and then we'll do a wrap up from the panel and I want the panel to start preparing themselves just one or two sentences on what you would improve. From your institution, what needs to improve uh, to uh, take this agenda forward? But first, Simon, over to you to respond to the question. So one, I think the, the main innovation has been the ability to bring insurance tools to, to bear on uh, things that aren't uh, fixed assets that uh, fall down and then get rebuilt with insurance proceeds. That's the normal kind of way that climate risk is covered um, in the, uh, up until the last 20 years or so. Um, but we've been, we've been looking at tools which actually use the, uh, the hazard itself as, the, uh, as, a, as an indicator of, uh, of losses which may be to livelihoods, to ecosystems, to more uh, esoteric things than just stuff that's built. Uh, and that's in the, in the Western US, for example, there are um, there are uh, governments, county governments, city governments who uh, desperately need a way of, uh, of, of getting finance quickly if their budgets for fire containment get shot in the first month of the fire season. So these sort of tools can be applied um, to other climate risks particularly um, where they haven't really been um, applied in the, in the developed world, but we have um, in, the, in the Caribbean um, and in, in Africa for drought uh, and in the Pacific for, for hurricane and earthquake. We have developed those tools and, and, and extended what the possibilities of what they can start to cover. Good, thank you, Simon. Sabera, over to you. Thank as you. As short as you can, if you don't mind. Okay, thank you. If, if I may address, um, before I, I, I address her, uh, her question. Um, I, I think uh, it's, it's an interesting dilemma. Um, I'd like to give an example um, about 10 years ago, the private sector had huge difficulties in trying to speak to public sector um, and say that they can make a difference, they can deliver. So, and that they were part of the solution in terms of delivering to the nation. And no one was actually taking them seriously and it was every single time you went to the public sector or cooperating partner and the usual uh, um, answer was that, uh, well, we only deal with governments. The scenario today on the ground is very different. Today, public sector is also financing private sector entities as well as civil society organizations. So I think there is a lot that can be done. 
I think for the, there is a fundamental change that public sector has realized that finance is really about providing finance to different actors, state as well as non-state actors, for the state to actually deliver on its mandate. So I think there, there's a lot of opportunity, and I would probably uh, uh, urge you to speak to um, both the LDC uh, uh, country reps, uh, governments, as well as the cooperating partners on that. I Excellent. hope I've... Thank um, you. Um, the the, you other, the yeah. other question in terms of um, capacity, I think, to, to, to replicate in, in other countries, um, I think that is, is, is probably where some of the opportunities are for um, various organi international organizations as well as partnering with local uh, organizations to provide that capacity. Uh, a lot of the times you find that uh, in the decision-making system in governments, you will find a lot of the technocrats are expected to understand how the private sector behaves. They've never been in the private sector. They don't actually understand private sector. So you've got this um, you know, silo effect. The private sector is, is, is thinking in a particular way, and the public sector is thinking in a, in a, in a particular way. We need to find um, intermediaries who actually can connect the dots, who can, who can make these two entities understand each other. And that's how I think that we can bridge the gap and, and have uh, public finance going one way and private finance also flowing in. Um, Excellent. So, sorry, I don't actually have an answer for you in terms of how many um, require that, but um, maybe the Honorable Minister can, can help. <laughs> On well, thank you, uh, Sabir. Now, there will be opportunities, obviously, to engage after this, so um, please do take those forward. So I want to start wrapping up, and I want uh, each of the panelists, if you can give me one or two sentences of uh, what you would improve in your institution, the national government of uh, uh, Uganda, or the Adaptation Fund, or the institution that you uh, represent. I'm going to start with you, Fry. What, what would you do better if you could? Just one or two sentences, please. Oh, thank you very much, Dion. I wouldn't actually, from the, I think, perspective of the Adaptation Fund, I wouldn't necessarily say, put it in that way, what we would do better. Uh, but I would kind of phrase it maybe uh, in a way to say what we would do more of. Uh -huh. um, so, and I'm sorry, just very quickly before I get to that, I think I need to emphasize one really important point. Capacity building is a long-term process. You mm -hmm. have to be committed to get into the process for the long haul. And we probably need to start moving away from trying to identify quick fix solutions to building capacity, particularly when we are talking about developing countries. It's a, it's a, it's a long-term process that requires commitment. And on that point, I think the Adaptation Fund has been involved with developing countries and financing adaptation in developing countries for over 10 years. The approach that the Adaptation Fund has been doing or has been implementing is based on country drivenness. And this is very, very important. The example I, I heard here about the terraces, uh, you know, and, 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 and beneficiaries abandoning mm -hmm. certain approaches just got me thinking about this country drivenness approach that the Adapt Adaptation Fund employs. And this is a process purely driven by the mm -hmm. country, initiated by the country. And it is very important for developing countries to also take ownership of mm -hmm. this process. So, Good, Frey, I'm going to cut you there. That was well over two sentences. <laughs> but very important point. Country driven and country ownership of these processes is critical. And you, you said you want to do more of that. Uh, Minister, uh, over to you. What, what, what would you suggest the uh, government of Uganda would do more of or do better going forward? Mm. Presently, government is allocating very little money for, for the environment. Mm -hmm. I think uh, I would suggest that uh, more money is put on the government, on, on the budget mm -hmm. to tackle impacts of climate change. Mm -hmm. I think that is good. Thank let, you so let much. Let me do what I can before I expect others to help me. That's a very, very good point, is that by allocating budget, you are signaling your commitment, and then others will help uh, as well. Uh, Simon. Well, so 
I'd like to have a really um, simple measure of resilience and gains in resilience. Mm -hmm. um, I think uh, Malcolm mentioned the, the mm -hmm. disconnect between the amount of money going into to, uh, mitigation and mm -hmm. that, that flowing into adaptation. I think one of the reasons is that it's, it's, it's relatively easy, uh, straightforward globally to mm -hmm. measure carbon emission mm -hmm. reductions. Um, it isn't easy to, to measure mm -hmm. um, resilience gains. Mm -hmm. um, so, and I think if we made, if we found something that we could capture, capture that in, that would mm -hmm. actually uh, um, open up the, 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 the pathway to, uh, to more Excellent. financing. Good, thank you, Simon. Lissy. I would think national governments will have to think seriously on how to change the way of doing things. Mm -hmm. In the wake of climate change, we don't do business as usual mm -hmm. in terms of policies, strategies, uh, tools, everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because for example, the GCF gives you 50 million US dollar and you expect it to have that's very normal Mm -hmm. See, uh, tools you cannot account for. Mm -hmm. So I think as governments, it's high time now to make sure that we have serious thinking on the way we do things, how mm -hmm. we do things, yeah. Excellent, thank you very much. Uh, Malcolm. I think we need to invest more in systems that uh, enhance the flow of knowledge and information up and down so everybody knows uh, what there is available and what can be done. I think we need to make sure that finance is patient and long term. And I think we need to make sure that we continue to invest and invest more in understanding impact and understanding uh, what then the next steps might mm -hmm. be, which is similar to the adaptation measuring thing, yeah. but not quite. Perfect. Thank you so much, Malcolm. Uh, Sabira. From beyond the grid fund perspective, I think um, what we could do better is um, Right now, we're looking at clean energy, uh, provision of clean energy in the rural areas. I think one of the, the, the conversation and partnerships that we need to, to build um, in-country partnerships is really looking at consumer affordability programs and how can we enhance livelihoods. So where is the money actually going in? I know that's not something that Beyond the Grid Fund can, can do, but we can actually partner with local organizations to get a better understanding of how consumers can afford energy services being provided by the private sector. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Beth. Um, I, just to reiterate that I think um, as uh, SDI and other uh, social movements, we believe that uh, the global architecture on finance for climate change needs to change. And uh, we're not expecting others to do the change. We are willing partners uh, to co-develop what this needs to be in order to address very grounded uh, mm -hmm. uh, challenges that the urban poor and other groups are facing. So we feel that we have something to, to contribute to that process. Excellent. Thank you so much, Beth. So there you have the wrap up uh, done by my panel. Uh, country driven, uh, country ownership, budget allocations by government, measurements of resilience, uh, changing from business as usual, uh, invest in, in, in systems of knowledge across scales, uh, consumer affordability, understanding consumer affordability and co-development. So thank you very much uh, to my panel. If you can just join me in giving them a, a round of applause. And thank you to all of you for staying the course. Uh, we ran a little bit over, but uh, thank you very much. It's been very uh, exciting and stimulating and, and great to have you all with us. Uh, Tracy, do you have any final announcements? Simon will make final announcements. Uh, on behalf of um, IIED, who I work for, um, the GRP, the Global Resilience Partnership, Willis Towers Watson for providing us with these fantastic facilities and London Climate Action Week, I just want to say thank you to everybody for coming along. Thank you particularly to each and every one of our panelists for an incredibly engaging discussion. We have heard uh, a really rich panoply, I think, of challenges, but also of practical uh, ideas uh, that can provide us with potential solutions for addressing the challenge of uh, the climate emergency. A few things that have stood out for me, though, from our, our counterparts in the LDCs is the, the fact that climate change is happening now. Lives are at risk and lives are being taken 
by climate change, by disasters, and, and by the, the effects of, of people's, uh, the, the effects of climate change on people's lives and livelihoods. But we have been given about uh, 11 and a half years now, it is, uh, by the IPC 1.5 degree report to achieve the kinds of changes that we need to achieve in order to avoid the climate emergency. Hence the urgency with which governments, uh, private st sector stakeholders, and all of us need to act to support the most vulnerable in the least developed countries, as well as in the developed countries, to adapt effectively. We've heard each and every one of the LDCs speak, uh, and also uh, representatives of the grassroots movement speak, to the challenge of accessing the money that they need to adapt with that urgency. We've heard some extremely positive ideas about how we can build a capacity over the long term, provide patient financing, but is that capacity building and is that patient financing going to deliver the finance with the urgency that is needed? That is the challenge that I put to financial institutions, donors and the private sector to support the LDCs and the most vulnerable communities who are at the sharp end, at the front um, of where climate change is, is having its effects in order to uh, make the transition happen as quickly as we need to see it. With that, uh, I'll call the meeting to a close and thank you all um, for your attention and for your contributions. <laughs>